Sergeant Alpers, you have the floor, sir. Um, Mr. Pringle asked me to discuss search and seizure tonight. Uh, he gave me some talking points. Uh, have you all reviewed the search and seizure policy in the personal cells? Talking about Terry, Terry Stops and Carol Doctrine. Um, he wanted me to talk about agent circumstances and also search incident to arrest. Um, I don't know, I have some prepared notes here, but I guess I will ask you what kind of direction you want to go with this in regards to how you want me to discuss it or if you want me to give broad strokes because it gives the broad strokes in the policy. Following notes and whatever direction you want to run in and we'll take you off on tangents. So for your, you lawyers, you'll, you'll probably get bored with this. Um, so we'll, before you start, Sergeant Alpers, I just want to let you know, I did find Morley Swindle's Guide to Search and Seizure online, and I sent that out to them. So they have more in-depth reading later, but that was this afternoon. Okay. All right. So we'll start with, uh, with a Terry, uh, Terry Stopper. It's a landmark decision. It's Terry v. Ohio from 1968. And just to read for you, it, it's under the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution, a police officer may stop a suspect on the street and frisk him or her without probable cause to, uh, to arrest if the police officer has a reasonable suspicion that the person is committed, is committing, or is about to commit a crime, and has a reasonable belief that that person may be armed and presently dangerous. Uh, so uh, essentially the, the case comes from, uh, I believe it's in Cleveland, and there was an officer that uh, saw some gentleman in front of a business and it was you know a, a time of night that wasn't proper and these guys had overcoats and so they stopped them and conducted a frisk of their outer garments and they located a, a handgun later and that's that's where this comes from they took it to the to the courts and they appealed it uh, and it went up in the supreme court um fell in favor of of the, uh, of the government, essentially, of the police officers. So it is a limited search. Uh, we, can, we can search as, as officers if we meet these requirements um, of the outer portions of that person. Uh, if we come across something that we believe is contraband, a weapon, then we can go in and we can take those items from them. What if you cannot readily identify the item? If you readily cannot identify the item, then you must pass on pass the item up. So something that we, we generally... Can you give an example? So that, that's what I was going to do. If, if you come across an item where, you know, in, in my history and in, in training, if I come across like a long cylinder type item, uh, that could be a, a number of things. I've seen people use, you know, old pieces of glass to smoke crack with. I've seen people use it to snort drugs with. Uh, but if I can't, re as a reasonable person, say this is an item used um, illegally, I have to pass on from that uh, and, and leave that item there. Now, again, in my training, in my, um, in my career, I can pretty confidently say that I know what a marijuana uh, smoking pipe is like because there's a large bowl on the outside and then there's a long cylinder with it. So if I come across that and I feel that item, then I can reach in there, take that item out if I reasonably believe that's a, a, a part of contraband. Same thing with a weapon, too. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, he also asked uh, where training you know, comes from or where this begins at. And the training starts at the academy. And uh, they, they start off with constitutional law. Uh, you know, the United States Constitution and the Missouri Constitution, and they talk about when you can search, what you can search, how you can search, uh, and then these, these different things. And it, it further extends into field training. So our field training officers talk about that, they go through that, so when they come to something, they can talk about, this is the proper time to search. You can search here, you can't search here. Uh, you can search this item, uh, you can search this box, you can search in this glove compartment. Uh, and then continuing training. So in our in-service training, we talk about anything that's changed in regards to search and seizure. Um, 
which is always changing. That, that Fourth Amendment is always changing, and, and we starts to go one way, and then it'll go another way, and then it'll go another way. Um, but it's a, a continuing uh, change. It's it's changed in the amount of time I've been an officer. It's been ten years, and it's changed tremendously. Questions on Terry D. Lyle, Terry Chris? Uh, something to extend onto that. Um, some people get worked up about if we pull somebody out of the vehicle, we do a Terry Chris based on prior knowledge of that person, and we, then we do the same thing to their car. You can Terry Chris a car as well, uh, and that's going to be essentially a wingspan type thing. So anywhere that person could place something or hide something. Based on knowledge of that individual? Prior history, carrying of weapons. Um, and then, but he also has to meet within what the US Constitution says as well. As far as wingspan, that's gonna essentially be the entire interior, right? But if you, you know, if you're in a, like a. Well, like an excursion, a SUV or something like that. Yeah, if you're in an excursion, I mean, obviously if, I don't think a reasonable person would believe that me searching the back of the excursion would be a good carry for us. Well, I if, mean, they're, if they're sitting in the front seat. I guess uh, to double edge that, right? The possibility of tossing something, absolutely. right? And so what's sort of the mindset there on? on well, absent of me of viewing that, right? Um, you know, if, if that doesn't occur, then I'm limited to what he can do here and he or she can do, and, and that's it. Unless it's plain view. Unless it's plain view. So if I see somebody toss something towards the back and as I'm walking up to the car and I shine my flashlight in there, which we can do, it's, it's not a, an intrusive search. There's no reasonable expectation of privacy for somebody's car that has a window that you can see through. Um, and then I see whatever item and it's in plain view, I can reach in there and take that out. That's a, that's a very good question. Questions on... Terry stops. Within the stop, within the wingspan, the person has a closed bag. Can you open the set bag? Well, it all depends. If there's so many, and this is why search and seizure is so strange. If uh, there's a closed bag behind them and it's out of their wingspan, no. Um, you know, if there's a bag that's next to them in the seat, it's unzipped. It's, it's go in there and check. It's because it's within their wingspan to do so. And then get into closed containment doctrine. And That's correct. Okay. All right. So we'll move on to the Carroll Doctrine. Uh, the Carroll Doctrine is a very old law. We're, we're approaching 100 years on this. Um, so it, it, it's Carroll versus the United States. And it, it's a... Uh, another decision in 1925. Um, and, and this existed from the times when prohibition was going on and alcohol was being transported. And it essentially just discusses warrantless searches of motor vehicles. Um, and where it comes from is there was a gentleman transporting uh, alcohol in the vehicle um, and we searched the vehicle essentially. And what you have to have for the Carroll Doctrine is probable cause to believe that there is contraband contained in the vehicle, the occupants of the vehicle are currently not under arrest, and the vehicle is stopped on the roadway. So what in today's world, um, obviously alcohol is not illegal to possess in the vehicle. Um, in Columbia, you can even have open containers, but um, marijuana. If I have probable cause to search that car, I can search the car based on that probable cause without a warrant, um, based on that, on that smell of marijuana, essentially. It's a very simplistic law, essentially, but you have to meet these criteria to, to do those. If, you, um, if you're the reading type in 322, our policy 322, we talk about the Carroll Doctrine. Um, it's 322.7. And then right about that is Terry Cruz, I forgot to mention that. So 
Well, the, the key thing about Carroll Doctrine is probable cause. You have to have probable cause to make a warrantless search of that vehicle. Questions on questions on Carroll Doctrine. Questions on probable cause, as opposed to reasonable suspicion. For those of members of the board and public who aren't attorneys, you know, talk about the difference between PC and reasonable suspicion. Sure. All right. Uh, so I use uh, I use traffic stops. Sometimes that's the easiest way to convey probable cause and reasonable suspicion. Um, we have to have reasonable suspicion to stop. The, the minimum standard is reasonable suspicion to stop a vehicle that a, a crime has occurred, about to occur, you know, is occurring. Um, probable cause would be an expired license plate. Uh, probable cause for an arrest is the standard that you believe that 50.1% that this crime has been, you know, has happened by this person that committed this this incident or this crime, uh, about 50.1% of your belief. Um, and it, it all falls under the reasonable standard. So well, we, we are held under reasonable, what a reasonable person would believe. Um, the PC is way different than, than reasonable suspicion and, and a lot of people you know, they like to they like to argue and, and understandably so reasonable suspicion compared to probable cause and reasonable again it's, it's what a reasonable person would believe is this is why we did this this is why we made this stop this is why we contacted you uh, this is why we're doing this because we reasonably believe this happens so it's, it's sometimes a hard concept to understand um, but it, they're very simplistic most times. Questions on that? Moving on. So the underneath the Carroll Doctrine, uh, Mr. Pringle asked to talk about Arizona Weekend. This is a fairly new law. This is about a 10 year old law now. Um, so Arizona Weekend kind of changed the way that we search vehicles. Um, prior to this, if you were arrested out of your vehicle, regardless of, excuse me, regardless of the reason for arrest, uh, an officer could arrest you, search the vehicle, and everything in it, um, and be done with it. So Arizona began comes along, and this gentleman was a known suspended driver. Uh, he was stopped in Arizona. He was placed under arrest for. Uh, driving while suspended, put into a patrol vehicle, and the officers also knew that he was involved in narcotics. They searched the car, uh, they found cocaine over, um, in the vehicle, in a coat, I believe. Um, and so this is what was held by the Supreme Court. The police may search the passenger compartment of a vehicle incident to a recent occupant's arrest only if it is reasonable to believe that the arrestee might access the vehicle at the time of the search or that the vehicle contains evidence of the offense of arrest. So the key words there are offense of arrest. So what is held is that he was arrested for driving while suspended or revoked. Um, what are we looking for as far as evidence of driving while suspended and revoked? And the only thing I could even remotely think of would be a driver's license, but that generally isn't gonna tell you. Uh, I don't believe we even put suspended or revoked anymore. License, but um, that's what came about that. So, if I pull over a vehicle today, um, short of reason, I'm sorry, short of probable cause, um, and we release the vehicle to the, a person in the car, um, the car cannot be searched, just that person. The car's towed, uh, we do an inventory. And then anything located. In AKA the search. It's an inventory. So Sounds like a search to me. Well, it's it's classified as an inventory because we are responsible for that person's belongings, and we have to and we have to account for whatever's in that vehicle. And during that inventory, we have to find anything that we believe is of value. So I can't go looking underneath the hood of a truck uh, to inventory that vehicle. With things that would be in the compartment of that. So you're just looking in the glove box, the comp, the arm console, and the trunk? And anything that's in plain view. 
but you're not precluded from having a dog walk around and do a free air or open air sniff. That's correct. How would, um, and I, I don't know, I just kind of thought, how would flight from the vehicle um, affect that? You know, absent PC for searching the vehicle, someone flees the vehicle before you can secure them. How does that affect searching the vehicle itself? Well, I think you go back to, you know, we're going to most likely tow that vehicle. Okay. And so you will do an inventory of that vehicle. Um, I think it could be, you could reasonably say, well, what is he running from? Um, is he running from something in the vehicle or is he running because he's scared? Is he running because he has a warrant? Is he running because, you know, he, he has something on him, on his person? So it's a case by case basis, but generally people that flee vehicles and leave their vehicles are going to be towed just because whatever reason. Questions on that? I guess a follow on question. Mm -hmm. So if you tow a vehicle and you inventory it and you find contraband, those charges are going to be levied against the owner of the vehicle, regardless of who was driving. Would that be accurate? Mm, no. So you would levy the charge against who's, who's in control of that vehicle? Okay. The immediate control. So, you know, if, you, if, if I borrowed your car and I had some illegal contraband in there and was pulled over, arrested for whatever reason, and you know, during that, that time they found something illegal, I'm in control of that car. That's going to be my hit. Okay. Um, again, uh, Mr. Pringle wanted me to ask about uh, or talk about training. It all starts back at the academy, continues on at the department with field training officers, uh, continuing education, search and seizure classes, um, just continuing training. That way. So, uh, the two more. There's uh, exigent circumstances. And exigent circumstances are circumstances that would cause a reasonable person to believe that entry, and I should put quotations, into a building uh, was necessary to prevent physical harm to officers or other persons. Uh, the destruction of relevant evidence, the escape of, an, of a suspect or suspects, or some other consequence improperly um, frustrating legitimate law enforcement efforts. Um, key things for exigent circumstances um, for just general purpose things would be, I come to a home, uh, I was called there for a disturbance, nobody answers the door, I hear a person screaming in there, uh, or I can articulate that there's a fight going on, there's a physical disturbance. Based on exigent circumstances, I can enter that home because that is still a, it still falls under Fourth Amendment because people are secure within their, their homes and illegal searches. I can enter that home to assess essentially what's going on. While in that home, if we find something, you know, criminal, some sort of criminal thing that's in plain view, if, it's, if you're looking at thinking about the contraband part of it, that has to be assessed. Um, but we can enter that home to make sure that those people are safe. Um, what's going on? And if the contraband's unrelated to the initial call, if you get called for, say, a fight, and you find a pound of high grade Colombian coat sitting on the table. I'm gonna pull everybody out of that home. We're gonna do a protective sweep of that home to make sure there's nobody in there. And then we'll, we'll write a search warrant for the house to go in and seize. Even though- In my opinion. Yeah. Sure, even though the coat was not the initial basis. That's right. Call. That's right. So let's say you're called out for a noise violation for a college age party. Right, and just some random townhouse. Get there, and it's pretty big. Would exigent circumstances allow a police officer to open the door to the townhouse next door and go in just because he sees young people in there drinking something from red cups? Two separate residences. He showed up to, this is this, I see something here. Can he then open the door and walk into that house? I think you have to weigh the government intrusion into the home in regards to what's going on. I mean, I've lived through this yeah. with a CG officer years ago, and so that's it's always been interesting to me if there's a justification that we couldn't see. 
Um, there are, you know, the, the city has a very strange ordinance uh, for nuisance parties, and there is talk in the ordinance about entering homes in regards to nuisance parties. Um, me personally, I'm not going to go enter somebody's home over minor drinking alcohol. Just me. Or what I believe is minor drinking alcohol. I don't think that's exigent enough to go in. I mean, we see people, we see underage people drink all the time. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that's exigent enough, or it even meets the requirements of exigency to go into one, in my opinion. So when someone walking down Broadway with a styrofoam cup with a red straw give you reasonable suspicion? Um, being a resident of Columbia <laughs> and knowing exactly what you're talking about. We, yes, I, I understand where you're coming from, mm -hmm. but I think it, um, I think you're starting to cross a, a, a weird gray line there. Right. Um, because you can go buy styrofoam cups and red straws at Sam's Club, and we can all pretend like we're having chocolate bill cores at the CPRB meeting. Mm -hmm. um, you have no idea what the contents of the car. Yeah. Now, I, I think coupled with watching somebody walk out of that establishment with the cup, with the distinguishable straw, um, I think you have started to grow further from that. But if I see them walking, you know, down at College and Broadway with the same cup. I, I don't think we're there yet. Is it at all concerning if they come out and immediately get into a car and drive off? Well, again, you, they've technically, if what is in that cup, and I think at that, at that point, I would have reasonable suspicion to investigate a crime of an open container type thing. But yeah, I'm sort of envisioning, like, to that, even what I just said, like, if you watch them walk out of the establishment, so that with two cops and they get in a car and drive off. And I think we would all agree that that is enough reasonable suspicion to believe that they have an alcohol beverage that they walk out of the establishment onto a public roadway into a car. It's the least probable cause to investigate. I wouldn't call it probable cause. Reasonable suspicion. That's going to be reasonable well, suspicion. That's what I mean. Yeah. So, you know, the that. I, I think that's reasonable to stop that and temporarily detain them to further investigate. Seeing somebody walk down the street that's so many blocks away, I don't, I don't see that at all. Even though we all know what's going on, but that is a you know, that could be potentially an illegal search and illegal detention. All right. Um, to continue on with exigent circumstances, one of the cases that I bring up is uh, Missouri versus McNeely. And this is a blood draw case uh, that drew great attention, ended up becoming a landmark case uh, across the nation. nation excuse me. Um, and the trooper stopped an individual for a suspected in, uh, DWI. He was arrested. Uh, the gentleman refused to provide a sample of his blood. Um, and the trooper directed the, the, uh, the healthcare personnel to take blood from, um, from this person. They take the blood, they get it, he uh, is shown to be over the legal limit, and he's subsequently convicted of, of DWI. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And at the Supreme Court, I believe it was a 5-4 a ruling and they felt as though that there was arguments on two sides that the naturally dissipating alcohol from the person's body wasn't enough exigency to do the intrusion into the person and intrusion being i mean that's a that's pretty intrusive you put a needle in somebody's arm you take blood out and that's it's very intrusive and we have to weigh that out when we decide what we do uh, and the supreme court decided that um, Short any exigency, which they didn't believe he had, we couldn't direct healthcare um, providers to, to take that blood. And what we should do is, in fact, attempt to gain a warrant before we do that. And so now, it, the way we work with, with blood draws in regards to DWI is that 
I have to have a blood, or I'm sorry, I have to have a search warrant before a blood, blood draw can be taken, short exigent circumstances. And what we are seeing is that the Supreme Court did not put what an exigent circumstance would be. Um, so what I talk about and teach whenever I would teach DWI is that in Columbia, it's fairly easy for me to get a warrant for blood, and I have two very capable and large hospitals with plenty of staff that can get blood. Uh, if you go to Mercer County, Missouri, uh, that is on the border of Iowa, and uh, you know it's a very small rural county, trying to get a judge in the middle of the night uh, and get a warrant is going to be very difficult um, compared to, to me. So I can see where they would have more agency to get that warrant. And I always take into account what's the level of crime as well. This is a B misdemeanor DWI, and I can't get a search warrant, but I really want to push it uh, to do an intrusive um, thing, such as taking blood from somebody. Is it somebody that just ran over a family, and you know we had a huge crash, and people are injured or killed? Uh, now sh is that agency there? If I can't get a search warrant. So that's where that's where we fall right now with uh, with McNeely. So prior used to be we could do it without a, a warrant. Now it's with a warrant, short agent circumstances. Questions on agency? So the last uh, item that he wanted to discuss was uh, search incident to arrest, and this is very simple. It's uh, if a lawful arrest has been made, a person can be searched without a warrant. Uh, this prevents destruction of evidence and access to weapons. Um, and again, this is training in the academy, uh, field training officers, and continuing education. So the, the search incident to arrest is very, uh, very simple. It, it kind of explains itself. So if I arrest Brandon um, and he becomes mine and I seize him, I can search his person. Anything that I locate on this person that's uh, illegal, uh, I can seize that. Item. So a point of clarification that I've never been real clear about, when you use the language to obtain a warrant, what, what is that process? Okay. So um, if we have probable cause to believe uh, that X is happening, uh, what we can do is we can produce a document, and it's a seven-page document that says, Based on these facts, I believe there's probable cause to exist um, that I need to do this, whether that's enter a home, enter a vehicle, seize a phone, seize a computer, seize blood, seize this person, um, seize this house to go in to get this person. Um, and we put, these, we put this document together, um, and at our agency it goes through certain levels of command depending on what the search warrant is for. Um, once that's been signed off on by commanders, uh, then we send it to the prosecutor. The prosecutor reviews it. If they have questions, they'll contact the officer. If there are no questions, they'll sign off on it, and then we forward it to the judge, and we wake the judges up in the middle of the night. Sometimes that doesn't go too good. Um, and then the judge will read it, swear you in, and, and uh, if they determine that probable cause exists, they'll sign off on the warrant, essentially saying that the government's intrusion into somebody's privacy, but whether that be their home, their car, their phone, their item, or the, the government's interest outweigh the person's intrusion into their body, say for blood. Um, if they believe that also exists, they'll sign off on it, and then we have that uh, we have that document that says, "Hey, we can do this regardless of what you're, you know, if, if you give consent or not." What's the time frame? So when I was in DWI, my um, the quickest I ever got a warrant was about 40 minutes, um, and that's um, had my stuff in order. It was not too late in the evening. Um, we were doing it all digitally. Uh, before we did that, you know, you can push a couple of hours. So 
depending on what you're doing, homes are harder to do because you got to explain what the home is. You got to explain, you know, what it says on the outside of the building, what it, you know, how it's recognized, what it's specifically I'm looking for, what I'm going to be looking, um, you know, what I'm searching for. Where blood is very simple. It's, you know, what I'm searching is this person, right? It's this person. They weigh this. This is their birth date. This is their uh, driver's license number. They're currently being held at the police department. These are why I believe there's probable cause um, for this arrest, and then our evidence is located within that person. So, 45 minutes, the quickest, a couple of hours, the longest. Um, prior to working here at the agency I worked at before, we could take up to three and four hours just because trying to find a judge in a smaller county is a little bit more difficult. So, what happens if you take three hours to get a blood draw? By that time, you do you infer the level at the time of the stop based on calculations? You can do, so they used to do what's called an extrapolation. And you can kind of go back and, and give a general idea of what the BAC was. Um, where we run into issues is if we pull somebody over, and I've ran into it a few times where somebody has a point of weight, you know, to point oh nine five BAC. Well, I can tell you within an hour, they, are going to be either close to being under or under. Um, so we, you know, you run into a three-hour search warrant. There's a high probability they're going to be under, but uh, BWI is based under impairment. Um, so if you can show impairment in a court of law, you can still be convicted of DWI without that number. Uh, but it, it can be a problem. But if you have somebody that's fallen down, drunk, you know, can't stand up, can't talk, um, is obviously a very high BAC and high impairment. Time, a three hour time frame isn't that big of a, of a problem for us. So now we have to, we're responsible for that person for three hours longer. Um, so I think that is more daunting than trying to get that warrant. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about electronic searches, searches of cell phones, of electronic equipment? Um, so we, uh, nothing changes as far as search warrants go. We have to have a, a reason to believe that. Um, Within that phone, there could be evidence of a crime. Uh, so if we seize a phone, uh, we can take that phone, hold it, produce a, a search warrant. Um, if the search warrant signed off on it, we would take it and have it uh, downloaded. Now, phones are getting smarter, um, and companies are smarter too, so getting it unlocked has been sometimes proven difficult. Does it make a difference if it's unlocked? I mean, if you, at the time you secure the phone, it's open and unlocked. Does that make a difference to the officer's ability to look into the actual yeah, it, inside? It, if, if it's something where it's not an instant time frame, um, and for me personally, I can't see where agency exists with a phone short of them remoting in and deleting something that says this is where this person is being held hostage at and they're going to die within an hour. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're held to the standard of. You can't do anything until you search for it. Um, you know, keeping a phone unlocked, I think, could potentially be a, a search, and I think you might lose that. I, are you talking about keeping it unlocked until you Well, are able I to mean, like, it? if you're arresting somebody and they, like, my phone's locked right now, but if it's open and everything, does that change? I guess, uh, is, is there any similarity, like looking in the back of the vehicle, right? Like it's out in the open, it's not secure. So you're talking about something where it pop up on the screen. Right, like they've got the phone open. I can the officer even just kind of open messages? Like can they look at what's in there because it's not secure? Yeah, I don't believe so. I, I think that's, in my mind, in my opinion, that's considered a search. If you're starting to go through and look at people's messages because, okay. you know, you're that's an extension of you, an extension of your home, and you, you still should be able to be felt as though you were free from searches and free from you know, government intrusion into your life, uh, especially in, in circumstances like that. Phone arrest or phones customarily searched? Not generally, unless there's, we believe that the phone is being used for some sort of crime. I, I have a question. I just want to make sure I'm understanding it right. So let's say that there is um, drug deals being done. Does it become a federal charge if it's cross state lines, those phone calls are made across state lines? 
So I'm not up to date on federal law, but uh, potentially they can use wire, wire tap, or using phones to large distribution of, mm -hmm. of the illegal narcotics. The feds can't come in and induce things of that nature. Because I thought I just read that. Yeah, we we wrong. don't have that. So the, the state of Missouri doesn't have anything similar to that. But you know, drug dealing and phones generally go hand in hand together. Right. Um, so the, the feds would generally pick up on selling narcotics via phone or making deals over the phone. Can you touch on canine searches? Walking, walking the dog around the car, man, how? Um, so the first one would be, I think we talked about this at an appeal in February, about the time frame. So if you can't hold somebody longer than what's reasonable for the stop and to be able to conduct your business and finish your business, unless you have some articulable facts to keep them and keep them seized there to bring a canine officer and, and their partner. Um, but a canine can walk around a car um, and do a free air of smell. Um, they can go into schools with permission from schools. I don't believe we do that here. Um, but if you, for, for instance, if you were to go to you stop the vehicle for a turn signal violation, and you approach the vehicle, you contact the driver, and you got the information, you go back, you issue a warning or a summons. And once you're done there, you're done. You, you know, you've got, now you've got to have some sort of reasonable articulation to seize them longer. Um, and that's, that's been local, or not locally, but um, nationwide, and that's been a point of contention, and there was some case law that came out about that. Uh, in regards to how long we can keep somebody. There's not a hard number. Um, so it all comes back down to reasonableness. Does that kind of get to where you're at? Now? Sure. Now, not saying that it's ever happened, officers just patrolling, dogs are walking around, and all of a sudden, just the dog just does a 90 degree turn and goes, we, and just sits, does an alert, whatever your dogs do. Is that considered free air? Are you talking about in a residence or a person? Just walking down the street. And they just, they alert to something? Mm -hmm. uh, I believe there's a reasonableness to believe that that person has narcotics um, based on that, based on that dog and the training that the dog is And that would generate reasonable suspicion? To make a contact, yeah. Can the dog enter a vehicle? Short of, give me, give me an example. Uh, free air, sniff, dogs, windows down, officer walks the dog around the car. Okay. Can he... if, if, if the dog alerts to it, then the dog can be put in there. That's correct. Now, I've seen a dog jump into a car during a sniff of a car. <laughs> um, it was quite interesting. Um, but, yeah, so I just, I've never seen that before. I don't know if I'll ever see it again, but I've just seen a dog jump into that window. And thankfully, the window was rolled down, otherwise, the dog would have you know, had, had a bruised mouth. Started out as mountain wine, ended up as a pub. Yeah, I saw a bird dog one time point at a car that had dead birds in it that had already been killed, and that dog was on the point because he knew there were birds in that in that vehicle. So I can. I can clearly see how a police dog might you know, leave in the window. Anything else with regard to searches? Any questions from the board? I have one other question. I'm not sure it really fits this topic that we're on. What does a citizen do when the citizen becomes aware of a prohibited driver, in other words, somebody who's had their license revoked or suspended and we see them on a moped or we see them on a motorcycle or what, what, 
can that citizen reasonably do to report that individual to the authorities? That's a good question. We had this come up uh, in DWI law. And if you are aware of somebody who was suspended, impaired, revoked, and you make that call and you make yourself known, right? That can give us not every circumstance, but there are circumstances that can that can give us reasonable suspicion to stop that vehicle, stop that person, and make contact with them and investigate further. It starts to get a little hairy when. You call in as an anonymous person and say, I think this person driving down the street is drunk, and you hang the phone up. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you call me and you, you know you call the dispatch center and you say, Hey, Brandon driving this um, this Tahoe and he's been drinking all day, and um, you know he, he drove away from his bar and uh, he lives at such and such place, and you have intimate knowledge of that person, um, that could potentially give us you know, that reasonable suspicion to, to make contact with that person. Now, it's always better if I were a fine brand driving down the road and then he's driving, you know, erratically or, you know, doing this, because that just strengthens our case, right? I have a first-hand witness. I have witnessed this traffic violation. I pull him over. He smells of intoxicants. He admits to drinking. So it just strengthens our case. But that could be something that if you call and say, Hey, I'm a first, essentially I'm a first hand witness to this. Because we don't see her, right? We can't be everywhere, every place. Last well, note, let's talk about consent searches where people say, you know, you walk up to a car, you might have to take a look. You know, I, know, I don't think you've got anything in, but just I want to take a look and the person goes, okay. Or doesn't say, no, you can't. Let's talk about consent. Do you still use consent cards? When do you need consent? When, when do you not? Just okay. like general overview. So I'll, I'll start with like a consensual contact outside of the vehicle. Um, so if, if Brandon and I are walking down the street, we can make consensual contact with people. And consensual contact means I approach you, you're not required to tell me anything, you're not required to answer my questions, you're free to go at any time. Now, if you decide to say, and we start having a discussion, and during our discussion, for whatever reason, I develop some sort of reasonable suspicion or probable cause of a crime. I can now detain you further for investigative purposes. Do you have to tell the person that they are not detained? No. And why did you stop them? We can, we can just make consensual contact with people. You, you can. Well, I mean, it's just like if you know, I saw you on the street and I said, "Hey, how are you? How are you, Miss Williams?" It's stuff, stuff like that. So if I know somebody in the neighborhood and I just happen to stop by and I say, hey, how are you? You know, they're walking down the sidewalk and for whatever reason, I, you know, we start talking and then for some reason I develop there's reasonable suspicion of a crime. I can now detain them further if I want and need to. Question, question. Okay, I'm going to be real honest. That just sounds like to me you're trying to free case somebody. Like you're on a fishing expedition. Okay. To see what you can find to arrest that person for. It just doesn't feel comfortable to me. I can tell you in my career, um, I've had zero consensual encounters that have led to something like that. It's approximate. It's roughly the same as seeing somebody on the street and saying, "Hey, how you, how you doing? How's your day going?" Essentially, and then they go, "Oh, it's fine, except you know, I got short and a quarter on the sound, so then if we know, yeah. you know, or if I if I'm walking by and I say, "Hey, how are you? How's your day?" Um, and I all of a sudden get nervous because I've had past bad experience with a police officer, but. My, you might now be perceiving that as saying, I got something on me that I'm hiding or I might have a, a arrest or warrant, but you're perceiving that my nervousness as me breaking the law somehow. So now that warrants you to continue to talk to me on a fishing expedition to see what is going on. That does not sit well with me at all. And I think something in, along those lines, 
would be how would refusal to engage be tolerated, or be not tolerated, be, be handled. You know, like if you engage a citizen like, hey, how's it going? They just kind of give you the side eye and walk on. Yes. Is that something that's going to be received? Especially in conjunction with what Bruno was talking about, like what is behavior that can happen with an individual, even in consensual contact, that pushes something over? I, I think it just, it, it's all gonna be <clears throat> incident based. If, if I walk up to you and I said, hey, how are you? And you're like, I don't wanna talk to you about it. You know, I don't have time for you and you walk on. I don't think there's anything there that means I can keep you and detain you any further. So even if I were to detain you, right, because it's a contempt of cop thing. Um, and then further down the road, for whatever reason, I end up searching for them. I find something of, of an illegal nature. I think there would be an argument to go to the court and say, okay, why did we detain this person? And, and where did this detainment come from? And, um, you know, explain to me your rationale in keeping them longer um, other than that consensual contact of me saying, hey, how are you? And then you tell me, I don't have time. Right. And, and quite yeah. honestly, that would be probably stopped at the supervisor level at the police department. And if not there, then the prosecutor would be asking those questions before the charge would even be filed. Okay. Something you just said, can you expand a little bit more on contempt of the cop? Yeah. So, um, you know, a lot of people use that term, and it is one of those things where if you say, um, hey, you know, I don't want to talk to you, and, you know, you can whatever, explicit, 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 um, and an officer continues to push on things or continues to do stuff like that. Um, you could refer to that as a contempt of cop type, type situation. Um, you know, you, the only reason you did that is because, you know, you're mad at me for not allowing me to search the car and not allowing me to search the, my person. And people refer to that as contempt of cop. Okay, so it doesn't mean a situation where the cop has gotten, or the officer has gotten upset at the way he's being treated and decided to further detain an individual. No, it's okay. just a, a term loosely associated. I was, I was a thing, like I heard it similar to like contempt of court, right? Like you're not doing oh, what no, I want no, you no. to do. So now it's I'm just like they, the only reason I did this was because the, they were mad. They also were Okay. And you, you got contempt of cop. Okay. So. Gotcha. Language is hard sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Are individuals required to ID themselves? If, can you walk up? I mean, you can always ask. Are they required yeah. to produce ID? Again, if you have a consensual contact, they're not required to identify themselves. Uh, if I were to walk up to you and I say, hey, how are you? Hey, can I see your ID? You're like, yes, no. And then we're essentially over. Like, we're done. Unless there is some other articulable reason that I keep you there. Do I have the right to ask you why? Oh, absolutely. You can engage. And you, do you legally have to tell me why? I could just tell you. I mean, there's no legality to it, but I can say I was just saying hi. How are you today? No. Do you? Okay. So if you decide, you come up to me and you say, "How you doing?" And oh, I see what you're saying. Right. Yeah. So if I if I determine that there's further reason to detain you, is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a legality part. I don't think it bodes well for an officer to not tell you why we're keeping you any further. So, I mean, what what do what do I gain in hiding from telling you why I'm keeping you or not keeping you? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, communication works both ways, regardless of what. If I'm wearing a uniform or you're wearing a uniform, I think things work better if we can have good communication, regardless of what has happened before and what the outcome ends up being. But if okay, so as a citizen, and I ask you why you're still detaining me, and you don't tell me, does that give that citizen legal rights then? There could be a potential civil litigation. But there's no legality in that I have to tell you why I'm detaining you. Again, I think it's because it you, be you, if you're the moment that you detain me, I am technically under arrest because I, I don't have the right to walk away. But you, arrest and, and detainment, you, you're talking two different things. Right, but I still don't have the right to walk away if you are detaining me. That's correct. 
And that's why because I, the moment I walk away, what happens? Well, there could be a, um, a, res a resisting a lawful detainment. Or resisting arrest. They're, they're all interchanged. Exactly. So, never mind. Right. So, like, if because that's kind of how a person will determine whether it's a consensual contact or not from the perspective of the non-law enforcement mm -hmm. officer, right? They mm -hmm. stop and they say, "Hi, how are you? Can I see your ID?" The person could say, "Am I free to leave?" Because that's kind of the touch. And if and if, and if they say and if a citizen says to you, "Am I free to leave?" and you say no, then what? Then. My hope is that that officer has developed some reason, either reasonable suspicion or probable cause, to keep you there further. And so I say to you, why, why are you detaining me and you don't tell me? And now you're asking for my ID and I say to you, because this happens, I've seen thousands of videos of this happening and the person is saying, why do you need my ID? Mm -hmm. Again, I think Communication on both levels is the key part there. I, I think if, if I'm taking somebody and I'm delaying them of their rights to walk away or they're delaying them of their freedom to be free of the Fourth Amendment, uh, we need to have good communication as to why. Right? There's no legal standard that says that I have to tell you why you're being detained. So we have a common understanding of the terms you mentioned consensual detainment and custody or arrest. Can you define each one so we can have a reasonable understanding of what each is and can the differences? You, you the consensual contact, which we just walked through, yeah. detained, arrest, or custody. So the, the consensual contact, do we, have, do, we all, yeah, do we all get that or have questions before I move on from now? Oh. Yeah, no, I got okay. it. Okay, yeah. looks like you went on that one. Okay, so the detained one is, detained can be a, a numerous amount of things. So if, if, I, uh, if I conduct a traffic stop and Brandon and Brandon's friend and Brandon's friend's friend is in the vehicle, I have, a, in, in essence, detained everybody. You were detained, right? Because as soon as I turn those lights and those sirens on, I have now reduced your freedom of movement, right? So you were not free to go. You're being detained based on the reason that I stopped the, the vehicle. Uh, detained being, I'm, you're not under arrest, but you're not free to go. So if I come to a, a home that there's been a, a fight at, two people involved, and I'm restricting your ability to leave, and I tell you you're not free to go, that means you're being detained, and you're being detained under the premise of I'm conducting an investigation based on reasonable suspicion of probable cause. So an arrest, the last one that we talk about is, if I arrest you, there's probable cause for your arrest. So 50.1% that I believe that you've committed this Crime, whatever crime may be, you know, uh, it could be a traffic ticket for any, you know, a, a traffic ticket up to a homicide. But if I arrest you, I've taken your your rights, your Fourth Amendment rights away from you, and I have taken custody of you, and now I, you are my responsibility, and you are no longer free to go anywhere. Uh, now I've entered this realm of uh, charges have to be. Um, made against you within a certain amount of time, and, or I can release you from that arrest, um, allowing you to, to walk away from that detention or, or an arrest. And a traffic ticket can be considered an arrest? That's correct. On traffic stops, everyone in the vehicle considered in custody? Detained, detained in custody. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the violator is most likely the driver of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. But everyone in the vehicle, they're detained. They came along for the ride, so to speak. Any other questions? So, what's 
So if I'm being detained, the thing that I'm supposed to ask you is am I free to go? Correct. You can ask that. And if you say no, and you say, well, I need to see your ID, and I say, for what? And you don't tell me, then I'm still not free to go, technically, right? That's correct. Once detained, are they required to ID? Again, you're going to have to go incident by incident. Do you have reasonable suspicion? Do you have probable cause? But generally, yes. But it just generally makes life easier. Correct. And again, good communication, I think, is key. It doesn't do anybody any good. So, you know, citizens or the police department to not explain to people why we're doing what we're doing. Anything else that we haven't covered? Anything else you want to share? Anything else that you think we should know? We went off, and I think we forgot a part of one of your original questions, actually. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So what, what if I don't have my ID? We can ask for the pedigree information. OK. Is, so are there incidents where if I don't have my ID, you now place me under arrest because you suspect that I may have active warrants and now I have to go downtown for you to fingerprint me to figure out who I am because at that moment that you asked for my ID and I said, well, I don't have my ID. Well, we have, fortunately, we have access to Wheels database. So if you give me pedigree information, a name and a date of birth, or a social security number, or uh, a driver's license number, we're able to access that system. And we all, when we got our driver's license, we had pictures taken of us. Um, so we can go that route, or we can go by um, scars, marks, tattoos. If for whatever reason somebody's in a database um, has been arrested before, uh, but just strictly not having your ID doesn't mean my eyes all a lot. Um, we have so many other ways that we can access things. It's not illegal to not have your ID on you. I guess how would that be received though? You know, I don't have an ID. And, and we've you, look at, you look them up and they don't have a driver's license. I am thinking of a person right now that I know does not have a, a valid ID anywhere. Um, We've come across that, and there's newer officers that don't know that come across this person. And, um, again, now you got to start thinking differently. Um, let's start looking into our database and see if we can find this person and see if we can find the, you know, this person that matches this description and our, you know, if they've been arrested, a prior booking photo, uh, something that can help us figure out who this person is. Because I'm seeing you, I don't have my, I don't have an ID. And you're saying, and you're trying to, I understand, you're trying to figure out who I am. Mm -hmm. But I say, I don't have an ID. Am I free to go? And you tell me, well, I need, I need to know who you are. And I say, why? I mean, there's that back and forth going on. I just look at it from a citizen's viewpoint. I'm trying to figure out why you stopped me in the first place. That, that's my concern. And I completely understand it. That's why I keep referring to going back to good communication between a citizen and an officer. Anything else? Nothing from the board? Anything from CPD? Yeah, I, I think <laughs> I'm going to say big thank you. Absolutely. I mean, this was in a nutshell clearer than they did in law school. Yeah. Well, Four minutes is, is tough. It's, you know, it's very contentious sometimes. And I think as a practical matter, it's good to hear from an officer's point of view of what each of these terms are. That's one reason I asked Matt to be defined because in the media you hear each one and nobody ever explains what they are. And so I think a lot of people are confused between arrested, custody, detained, and everything else, so I appreciate it. Moving on.